Hello and welcome to How to Manage Shock. This is part three, speaking of distributive type shock. If you haven't already seen it, go back and watch parts one and two, hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing, made incredibly easy. Hopefully I can make this incredibly easy for you too. Let's talk about distributive shock. D distributive shock occurs when we have fluid moving away from the heart. One of the most common reasons for having distributive shock is sepsis. Sepsis causes massive vasodilation out there in the periphery and it keeps blood away from the heart and then therefore there's not enough blood to pump which then creates a shock state. The same kind of situation can occur with anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock also causes an overwhelming out of control inflammatory response. One of the components of inflammation is vasodilation. Neurogenic shock can also cause massive vasodilation where we have the stimulation of the parasympathetic system without the unchecked or balanced stimulation from the sympathetic nervous system. And lastly, we can have spinal shock, which is caused by having massive vasodilation as a result of having an injury to the spinal cord. So here's what happens when we look at this diagram on the right. We see the heart and the vasculature, the lungs. So it's basically showing us what's happening with our hemodynamics, or in other words, with our fluid throughout the vascular system. So if we're starting in the heart, and let's say we're starting on the left side of the heart. So the left side of the heart is illustrated there in red, and it's pumping blood out to the periphery. Out there in the periphery, it goes out and oxygenates all those cells and the tissues, and then it comes back to the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart then pumps it to the lungs and then back to the left side. What happens in distributive shock is that we have vasodilation, especially of the venous system. So as you're looking at the bottom of that diagram there in the vasculature, and you see that venous side there, and it vasodilates. Now this is also called the venous capacitance system and about 70% of your blood volume sits out there in that venous system. The reason for that is that it sits out there waiting for when you're going to need it. If cardiac output goes up, our need for additional fluid will go up. Think of it this way. If you turn an IV pump up, Say the IV pump was running at a keep open rate, and now you're turning it up to 250 an hour. You're going to need more bags, right? So you need more volume when you turn up the rate. Same thing is true with the heart. If we turn up the rate of the heart, so you're exercising and your heart rate's going up, we're going to need more volume. The volume comes from the venous capacitance system. So it isn't just pumping blood faster through the vasculature system, but it's also mobilizing more fluid to the heart. In distributive shock, what happens is that this venous capacitance system increases in size so that more blood is sitting out there in the periphery and less blood comes back to the heart. Therefore, we will end up having a decrease in our preload or the volume of blood that's coming to the heart, which will then decrease our stroke volume and decrease our cardiac output. One of the other components that can happen with both septic and anaphylactic shock is we also get increased capillary permeability. This is another function of the inflammatory response. So overwhelming out of control inflammation that's caused by sepsis or caused by anaphylaxis is going to also cause an increase in capillary permeability. So fluid will actually leak out of the capillaries and into the tissues. If that happens, we're actually losing fluid in addition to displacing fluid. The decreased cardiac output is going to stimulate compensatory mechanisms. So we'll start to see an increase in heart rate. We'll start to see some vasoconstriction to try to maintain our blood pressure. Those compensatory mechanisms that we expect when somebody has shock. 
because sepsis is a progressive disease. The patient has an infection, the infection starts to become overwhelming, and now we have an overwhelming infection. We will go through these phases. Now we may see part of this, or we may see some of these symptoms with the other types of distributive shock, but this is very specific really to sepsis. If a patient has anaphylactic shock, anaphylaxis happens very quickly in most cases, and so we're going to move right to that shocky looking state right from the beginning. But in sepsis, we're going to have this initial hypermetabolic stage where the infection is starting to become overwhelming. We're getting that out of control inflammatory response that's causing vasodilation. Vasodilation, now think about this in your body. If you vasodilate, you flush. So you get flushing, right? We'll have an increase in cardiac output initially. So the blood pressure may actually increase, especially our systolic blood pressure, while at the same time we're having a decrease in SVR, which means our diastolic pressure will decrease. So we have a widening pulse pressure that occurs in this hypermetabolic state. We will begin to see some signs of decreased cardiac output and decreased perfusion, as evidenced by a prolonged capillary refill time. As this progresses into this shocky state, remember it's a progression. It's not, you know, these aren't two distinct phases. We don't just go from hypermetabolic, flip a switch, and go to shock. The patient will start to look shocky. So what happens here is that now because of this vasodilation and the decreased SVR, now the heart can no longer keep up, the compensatory mechanisms can no longer help, and we're starting to decrease our cardiac output and our blood pressure, and now the patient looks like they are in shock. So we have this, quote, warm phase, and we have this, quote, cold phase. And your patients who have sepsis or who have infections, we want to be watching for this hypermetabolic stage. So our treatment includes giving fluids. Being careful with our fluids, the uh, recommendation used to be just give lots of fluids and fill the void. You know, we've got this big open area and we want to fill it. We want to dump lots of fluid in there. Well, the problem with that is, remember, we also have capillary permeability, especially in the cases of sepsis and in anaphylaxis. So we're dumping lots of fluid in. Where is it going to go? It's going to go in the tissues because we have capillary permeability. We're going to use antibiotics for our septic shock, vasopressors, a number of pressors that could be used. There's a couple of debates that commonly occur when we're treating with septic shock or distributive shock. One is which vasopressor is better? Typically, we would say that Levofed is the superior vasopressor when we're dealing with septic type shock. And as far as our fluids go, there's been this constant debate for years. Normal saline or lactated ringers? Well, it depends on who you ask. You ask your surgeons, they like lactated ringers. You ask your medical guys, they like normal saline. So over the years, there's been this <laughs> debate forever. You know how well those two groups get along, right? So there's been this debate forever about which one of these fluids is better. Well, I think we have finally answered that with several meta-analyses that have showed that there's no difference. Use either one. Colloids are a possibility as well. Take a look at some of these statistics and things that you see over here on the right-hand side. 80% of sepsis begins outside the hospital. So it's happening at home. The patient's becoming infected. 70% of these patients have chronic illnesses. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Your patient's got a chronic illness. They're at home. They become infected. By the time they come into the hospital, well, they're coming in because the infection is overwhelming or because now their blood pressure is dropping and they're lightheaded and they pass out or they have a change in mental status. All those things are symptoms of septic shock. Most common infections, lung pneumonia, right? Urinary tract, skin infections, gut infections. Okay, it makes a lot of sense. So these are the things to look for. Look for the patient with pneumonia, the patient with the UTI, the patient with the skin infection or gut infection. Those are the common infections that cause sepsis.
Look for the patient who has a chronic illness, and again, most of this begins outside the hospital. A lot of our patients in the hospital who may be at risk for developing sepsis are already being treated with antibiotics for whatever the condition is that they have. And if they develop pneumonia, if they develop a UTI, we start treating it in the hospital. That's why 80% of these begin outside the hospital is because the patient's not being treated. So our best practice is early identification. Ding, ding, ding. That's the thing that's going to help. The earlier we identify the problem and treat it, the less the risk that this patient's going to have long-term complications. So we're looking for fever. We're looking for altered mental status, an elevated respiratory rate, and an elevated heart rate. Aggressive source control, let's take care of that infection so the patient doesn't end up like these guys here in the ICU. Blood cultures, administration of appropriate antibiotics, and early aggressive resuscitation. So how do we find this early? We keep saying, okay, well, you know, we got to find it early, treat it early, right? How do we find it? We use a SOFA score, or this is the Q-SOFA, which stands for a quick SOFA score. The SOFA score is a scoring system to help us to be able to find sepsis in the early stages. The three things we're looking for here, hypotension, a systolic less than 100, altered mental status, and tachypnea. These are common reasons why the patient may end up coming to the hospital. Remember, 80% of these happen outside the hospital. If the patient has one of these conditions, they are probably septic. And if the patient has two or more, it's associated with a poor outcome. So this is just a quick, easy screen. Now, why would we need something like this? Because, again, if 80% of these happen outside the hospital, the patient is likely to come to the emergency department. So we would want to do this screening in the emergency department. What if your patient is already on the med surge floor? We need a quick and easy screen we can use to be able to help and find sepsis before the patient develops septic shock. So now, comparison, comparing our different types of shock, hypovolemic, we end up with a narrow pulse pressure. Okay, that's the difference between systolic and diastolic. So we'd have a blood pressure like 90 over 70, right? And our volume is low. Cardiogenic, we have a narrow pulse pressure. Again, blood pressure looks like 90 over 70. But the volume is high. Distributive shock, we have a wide pulse pressure, and the volume is low. So how would we make a quick determination? We have a patient whose blood pressure is low. We're trying to figure out, well, which of these things is it? We know the patient's in shock. What kind of shock is it so that we can treat the patient appropriately? Look at the pulse pressure and look at their fluid volume. Well, how are you going to tell their fluid volume at a glance? Look at those jugular veins. So I look at my blood pressure. The blood pressure is 90 over 50. And my jugular veins are flat. What kind of shock is it? Distributive shock. Wide pulse pressure, low volume. I hope that makes sense to you. That's a quick and easy way to be able to determine which type of shock is occurring in your patient. Use the Q-SOFA scale to be able to find septic shock early so we can get prompt treatment for our patient. This is the shock triad here. Systemic inflammatory response, ischemia, and acidosis. These things are associated, any of those types of shock, these things are associated with having a poor outcome. So the shock triad, these three things here, these pieces we want to be watching for because that tells us that this patient is really critical and is going to probably have a poor outcome. So has the... In the initiation of the systemic inflammatory response occurred. Does the patient have acidosis? Indicated in many cases by an increase in our lactate level. And is there ischemia or signs of organ ischemia? Well, the first organ to be affected is going to be the brain followed by the kidneys and the lungs. So we want to be looking for those lung or those 
organ systems to be affected. And if those things are occurring, that's telling us the shock triad is initiated and that this patient could be headed for a very poor outcome unless we're able to turn this around very quickly. Well, thank you for joining me now for How to Manage Shock Part 3 Distributive. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.